all of those who are joining us either on our website, our app, or Facebook Live from wherever you are. Would you welcome them, Refuge, all of those who couldn't be with us live but are joining us online? Come on. Come on, welcome them this morning. Welcome to you guys. Hey, a few months ago, I shared with you about a company called Blockbuster Video and how they missed an opportunity in 2001 to purchase Netflix for $50 million. That sounds like a lot of money, but for Blockbuster at the time, it was only three days revenue, $50 million, and they passed on it. They didn't think there was really a market for video on demand, and by 2010, Blockbuster Video was gone, man. They were out of business. And there's a lot of other companies like that as well. When you think about, some of you might remember Pan Am Airlines. They started in 1921, went all the way up until 1927, until 1991. Pan Am Airlines, just a huge airline company. They're gone now. There's places like Border Books and Toys R Us and Polaroid and Kodak. Used to be these huge companies, and they're no longer in existence. You got compact computers and tower records. You've got Sears. And you've got, I don't know if you remember Motorola back in 2003. They had the top selling mobile phone up at that, at that point ever called the Razor. But they chose to not focus on smartphone technology. And guess what happened? Experts would say about those companies that they lost their cutting edge. You know what? It doesn't just happen to companies. It can happen to individuals. It happens to athletes. It can happen to professionals. And here's the thing, and this is what I want to talk to you about today. It can happen in our spiritual lives. We can lose the cutting edge. Maybe it was, you know, some tragedy that happened in your life. Maybe it was just the challenges, the daily pressure of the challenges that we face day in and day out. Maybe you lost focus in 2018. Maybe it was a lack of discipline on your part. Hey, maybe it was something unforeseen and something you had no control over and something just hit you out of nowhere and it caused you to lose your cutting edge. That's what I want to talk to you about today. How to recover your cutting edge. If you have your Bible or you're used to using some technology uh, to go into the Word of God, 2 Kings chapter 6 is where we're looking today. 2 Kings chapter 6. There's a great story in the Bible about someone who lost their cutting edge. Stand, if you will, to honor the Bible this morning, greatest book on the planet. 2 Kings chapter 6. If you're taking notes, you can do so on the Refuge app. Or maybe just pull out a piece of paper, write some things down this morning because I want to share with you three things that you and I have to do in order to recover the cutting edge. Second Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. If you're there, come on, say, I'm there. If you don't have your Bible or any kind of technology, we're putting it all on the screen for you this morning. Don't we make your life so good? Here we go, beginning in verse 1, it says this. One day the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. He said, I will. So he went with them. And when they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried. It was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, threw it into the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Verse 7, grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. You say that last part with me again. And the man reached out and grabbed it. Come on, before you're seated, I want you to make some declarations with me today about this amazing book we call the Bible. You ready? Nice and strong. Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I am confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in me, what? Come on, say that again. 
in Jesus' name. Do you believe it, Refuge? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let me give you a little background, a little setting for the story we just read out of 2 Kings 6. It took place in 8th century B.C. It's back in the time of the kings when Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. There was a prophet by the name of Elisha. He had received a double portion of the anointing that rested on a prophet by the, by the name of Elijah. Now Elisha began mentoring young men. And he had what some might call a school of the prophets. He was training these young men in the prophetic. He was training them in how to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And they had a great problem. Uh, Their their school of ministry began to grow. In fact, they outgrew the place that they were meeting, kind of like we did years ago. We were meeting on Central Drive, and God had just breathed on the refuge when we started 14 years ago, went from 40 to 400 people in the first nine months, and continued to grow to the point we were having four services every weekend over on Central Drive, and it was evident we needed a new place, and God gave us a bigger place. How many of you are thankful for that? Yeah. (laughs) Praise God. And you know what? We designed this place so we can knock these two walls out to your left and right and expand our stadium seating and take the auditorium from 1,000 to 1,350 seats. How many of you believe will believe with me? We're going to see such a harvest of souls. We're going to have to do that sooner rather than later. Come on, somebody. Yeah. They said to Elisha, Elisha, we've outgrown the place. We need a bigger place. Elisha says, Hey, great idea. They said, listen, let's go down to the Jordan. There's plenty of trees there, and we can build a a bigger place. And Elisha says, go for it. And they said, well, why don't you come with us? He said, all right, I'll go with you. So they go down. They begin chopping down trees, chopping. Anybody like to chop wood? I know it's a weird thing, but it's very therapeutic for me. Like, I love to chop wood. Put an ax in my hand, give me a pile of unsplit wood, and I love to split wood. I think about every person that's ever done me wrong in my (laughs) No, I'm just joking. I'm kidding with you. So they're out cutting wood. They're chopping down trees left and right. And all of a sudden, they face a real dilemma because as one of the young men are chopping wood, the the axe head uh, flies off of the handle and doesn't land on the ground. They could have fixed it then. But it lands right in the middle of the Jordan River. I can't wait until November the 1st. Melanie and I are taking a group from the refuge. We've already had a lot of people sign up, and we're going to be right there. We're going to baptize you in the Jordan River, those that are going with it. I can't wait. It's going to be a great time. But it flies into the middle of the Jordan River. And, and they, had a, they had a real problem there because in an instant, this young man lost his effectiveness. In an instant, he lost his ability to contribute to what they were building. In an instant, he lost his cutting edge, just like that. Didn't see it coming? And it just happened. That's the way life is for us sometimes. We don't see it coming, and all of a sudden, we lose our effectiveness. All of a sudden, something hits us out of nowhere, and we lose our ability to contribute to building the kingdom of God. It happens in life, happens to the best of us. That maybe for you it was 2018. Maybe you started out strong. Maybe you started out with Salem. Maybe you started out attending launch. You were on fire and, and things were going well. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some tragedy, some challenge, and you lost your cutting edge. There's no lumberjack tale of. Two men who were out on the job site. One was an old man. He was a seasoned lumberjack. And a young man who hadn't been on the job for very long, but he was very, very strong, very muscular. And he challenged the older man one day, and he said, Hey, let's see who can cut down the most trees by the end of the day. And the old man said, You got it. And so they began cutting down trees and the young man, with all of his strength and all of his vigor, is he's just going for it. But he, he looks over and he notices several times that the old man is sitting down, taking a break. He realizes, man, he just doesn't have the stamina. He doesn't have the strength that he once had. And so the young man, it just motivated him even more. He's just chopping as many trees as he can. And by the end of the day, the old man had chopped down a third more trees than the young man. 
And the young man said, I don't understand. I don't get it. He said, I never took a break. And I looked over many times. It seemed like every hour. And you were taking a break. And the old man said, son, what you don't understand, what you don't realize is when you thought I was taking a break, I was sharpening my axe. Abraham Lincoln said years ago, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening the axe. Look at what the Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. Using a dull axe requires great strength, so sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. Come on, anybody want to succeed in 2019? Let me see your hand. Come on, you want a year of favor. You want a year of prosperity, a year of influence, a year of blessings. And the Bible tells us we need to sharpen the blade, that it's wisdom to do so. Now, listen, there are three things that you need in order to sharpen an ax. Number one, you need a file. Number two, you need a stone. And number three, you need some oil. And I believe that you know, we have the opportunity here at the beginning of the year to sharpen our axe. I believe we have the file of the Word of God. How many of you know God's Word can rub some things off of our lives that don't belong? And how many of you would say, I need a little bit of that in 2019? Come on. We need the file of the Word of God. We've got the stone of prayer uh, where we come into His presence and, and we pray and we're sharpened through prayer. And then we have the oil of the Holy Spirit. And I believe the combination of those things allows us through wisdom to sharpen our acts in 2019 so that we are as effective as we can possibly be. But the reality is this, that some people have lost their cutting edge. Some of you have lost your cutting edge. Some of you watching us online, you've lost your cutting edge. Didn't see it coming, didn't plan for it, didn't know it was going to happen, but you lost your cutting edge. Let me give you three things quickly. How do we recover the cutting edge? Here's number one. You ready? Admit the loss. Oh, and that's where it gets a little bit tricky because in order to admit the loss, in order for us to say, you know what, I'm not as passionate as I used to be. I'm not as hungry for the Word of God as I used to be. I'm not as on fire for God as I used to be. I'm not as faithful to the house of God as I used to be. I'm not as passionate about the presence of God as I used to be. For us to admit that means that we have to give somebody a glimpse into our weakness. That's mighty difficult for some people in the body of Christ because we want to put on the mask and the facade and act like we've got it all together and like everything is good. Oh, bless you, brother. Yeah, hey, praise God. Everything's great. High five. Come on, man. Woo! Yeah, doing good. And on the inside, you're dying. You're dying because you've lost your cutting edge. What do we do? We have to admit the loss. We have to be willing to go to our brother or sister and say, you know what, I'm struggling, man. I'm not as on fire as I once was. Something's not right. When I come into worship, I just don't feel the passion that I used to feel. I don't have that quiet time like I used to have. Something has got to change in my life. Listen, that young seminary student, he could have remained quiet. He could have said nothing to anybody about the loss. But let me tell you what Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 says. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back. And then the Bible says this, that a cord of three is even better because it's not easily broken. A young man could have remained quiet when the axe head fl flew off of the axe handle. He could have just said nothing to anybody and remained perfectly quiet. Or he could have just kept going through the motions. Maybe, you know, he just wandered over to the side away from the crowd a little bit. Hey, some great trees over here. And he could have with the handle just kept going through the motions, acting like he was working. Woo! Man, working up a sweat over here, boy. And you know what? There are many people in the body of Christ that are doing exactly that. Going through the motions, just going through the motions, playing the whole religious game, playing the whole spiritual game, and all the while you've lost your cutting edge and you're not doing anything that's valuable to the kingdom of God. Why? Because you haven't taken time to sharpen your axe. Yeah, yeah young man, he, he could have just let the burden be on everybody else. He could have just used it as an excuse. Ah, oh, you know what? I was really tired. I need a break anyway. You guys have got it, man. Go for it. You can cut down the trees. No, he didn't do any of that. He quickly admitted that he had a dilemma. And when he did that, listen to me, he opened up 
the avenue for the supernatural. And some of you need to open the avenue for the supernatural. Why do we emphasize small groups? Because we believe that we are meant to do life together. We believe that when you join a small group, all of a sudden you're back to back with somebody that says, hey man, if the enemy comes at you in that direction, I've got your back and I'm going to fight with you. And we're going to do life together. We're going to admit that we have weaknesses. We're going to weep together. We're going to laugh together. We're going to pray together and we're going to be better because of it. And I challenge you, this first semester coming up, join one of our small groups. I believe when you admit the loss, all of a sudden you open up the realm of the supernatural. You free the hands of God to move in your life in a way that you cannot even imagine. Here's the second thing. Are you with me, Refuge? Come on, I need somebody to talk to me a little bit this morning. I need somebody to make a little noise in the place. I need somebody to get a little bit excited about the Word of God in this place today. The second thing we have to do is we've got to acknowledge the loan. You see, in verse 5, he quickly says, Hey, hey, got a problem over here. I lost the axe head, and it was borrowed. You see, this was taking place during a time where the Philistines had a monopoly on iron. The Philistines could make weapons. They could make agricultural tools. The Philistines could make all of this stuff, but the Israelites did not have access to iron. And so to have a weapon or to have a tool like an axe was something that was really, really special. So he realized, man, this is a huge dilemma, not just because I can't chop wood now, but because it was borrowed. Anybody ever borrow a neighbor's tool and while you've got it, you broke it? Oh, yeah, that's not a good feeling, man. Not a good feeling at all. Here's this young man who says, man, it was borrowed. This is a big deal. He said, it, it was borrowed. I need, I need something to happen here. Do you understand and do you realize that every ability that you have came from God? Do you understand and realize that every talent that you possess came from God? Everything that's happened in your life, every good and perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from heaven. It comes from the Father above. Hey, sure, you might have worked hard to build that business. You might have studied hard to get your master's degree. You might have worked hard to, to be a great employee. But listen, every ability that you have came from the Lord. Matthew 25 just tells us a parable about uh, about responsibility and about how important it is that every borrowed thing that we have, that we steward it well. And everything that you have is borrowed. It came from God. So when we lose the cutting edge, we have a responsibility to recover it. That leads us to the third thing. In order for us to recover the cutting edge, we've got to identify the location. Where did it happen? That, that's immediately what Elisha said. Hey, where did, where did it enter the water? Where did it go in? We never plan to lose our car keys, do we? It just happens. Like nobody gets up and says, you know, life is kind of boring. I've gone six months and haven't lost my car keys. I think I'll lose them today. Nobody plans to do that. It just happens. And when you lose something, normally you go to the last place that you remember having it. And for those of you who have lost your cutting edge, I want to ask you, where was the last place that you remember God using you? Where was the last place that you remember the anointing of God flowing in your life? When was the last time that you remember having that passion for his presence? When was the last time that you remember hungering for the word of God? Where's the location? You see, oftentimes what we do is we sit around and we mull over the, how did this happen? I've got this axe handle here. Gee, I wonder, how did the axe head fly off? Did something come loose? What happened? And what we do in life is when we lose the cutting edge, we want to just sit around and try to figure out, why did this happen? Or we want to figure out, who can we blame for it? 
You want to blame your spouse. You want to blame your employer who laid you off. You want to blame, you want to blame the bank. You want to blame the friend who betrayed you. You want to blame your children who have given you such a hard time. And rather than sitting around and trying to figure all that out, Elisha just said, hey, man, let's don't focus on that. Let's focus on where you lost it. And I want to challenge you, figure that out. Where did you lose it? Because some of you started out 2018. And man, you were, you, were, you were going for it. You participated in Selah. You showed up at launch. God touched your life. Man, I remember last January. I mean, God moved in so many powerful ways. You experienced miracles. Man, the fire of God was burning on the inside of you. And something happened. Something happened in 2018. And you lost that cutting edge. Maybe it was circumstances that you didn't see coming. Maybe it was a death. Maybe it was the foreclosure on your home or the loss of your job or a bad report from a doctor. Maybe it was the betrayal of a friend. Maybe it was relocating to a different city and you just haven't been able to get your legs under you again. Or whatever the case, whatever brought that on. Listen, the important thing is that we identify the location. And once we're willing to take responsibility for the fact that what we have was borrowed from the Lord, it was entrusted to us by God. And once we're willing to admit the fact we're not as passionate, we're not as hungry, we're not as on fire, we're not as fervent for the presence of God. Let me tell you what happens. Then you position yourself for a great miracle from the Lord. Elisha says, where, where, where's it? where did it go? And Elisha immediately goes over to that place. He takes a stick and he throws it into the water and all of a sudden he defies the laws of nature. When metal, or pardon me, iron floats from the bottom of that riverbed to the surface of the Jordan River. What did he say? What, 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 the stick? What, what, what happened? Why, why the stick? Why did he throw a stick in the water? What was it? What kind of wood? What kind of stick? Listen, I don't know. I don't understand how iron could float from the bottom of a river to the top except this. Our God is a miracle-working God. He's a miracle-working God. And the same one who could cause an axe head to float to the surface is the same one who can help you recover your cutting edge in 2019. He's the same one who can do it. Now, I find this interesting. Although God caused a miracle to happen, Elisha required the young man, in verse 7, to reach into the water and to retrieve the axe head. See, I believe this. God can and will do a miracle for you. But I believe God put some responsibility on us to grab hold of that miracle. God's going to do some powerful things in Selah. God's going to do some powerful things in the launch. I'm telling you, I have such an anticipation about what God is going to do in those four nights of revival. But you can sit back and miss it. You cannot show up and miss the move of God. You can be right smack dab in the middle of it and still not grab hold of what God's doing. But God wants to do a miracle in your life. And wisdom says we've got to step back from the dulling effect of life and sharpen the ax. We've got to take some time to recover that cutting edge. Every January at the refuge since we started Together we observe 21 days of fasting and prayer. We call it Selah. Selah is a term out of the Psalms. It's a, a musical term. It, it's like a breath note. It's a deliberate pause. And every January we take 21 days to deliberately pause. And to say, God, we want to sharpen the ax. We want to draw closer to you. Selah starts tomorrow. January the 7th. You might have noticed when you came in those two large sailor boards, sailor walls that are there. And I'm going to tell you in a moment what I want you to do with those sailor walls. And some of you have already figured it out because you saw what happened in the first service. Well, let me tell you, 
I, I believe this, that you'll very quickly forget the discomfort of these 21 days. But I believe that for weeks and months and years to come, you're going to realize the results and the impact and the miracles that happen as a result of your obedience to the Lord to seek Him, to wholeheartedly seek Him. Every year we have people that say, I've never fasted before a day in my life. Every year I have people tell me I've been in the church all my life and nobody's ever told me about fasting. Nobody's ever challenged me to fast. I feel, I feel like that's such a tragedy because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount when he was preaching, when you give, he didn't say if you give, he said when you give. He said when you pray. He just knew disciples were going to pray. And then he said this, when you fast. I don't think Jesus ever thought that there would be a day that disciples would not have fasting as a part of their lifestyle. He said, when you fast. Some of you have never fasted before. And every year I have people tell me, I've never fasted before. But I did this year, and we hear about miracles. I mean, breakthroughs, freedom that comes, bondages that are broken, answers to prayer that people have been praying for months and for years that happen as a result of obedience in these 21 days that are starting tomorrow. One of our elders, one of our lead intercessors came to me this week. God showed him three things about Selah this year. Number one was this that everybody participate on some level. Everybody. Everybody. I don't care if you've known Jesus for a week or for 50 years. Everybody can participate. You say, well, I, I don't know anything about fasting. Let me tell you a few things. Let me give you a few examples of things that you can do. In these 21 days, some of you might choose to observe a sun-up to sundown fast. That means from the time the sun comes up until the time the sun goes down, you don't eat. You eat before sun-up, you eat after sundown. But for those 21 days, sun-up to sundown, you fast. Some of you may choose to fast one meal every day for the 21 days. Some of you might choose to fast two meals every day for the 21 days. Some of you might choose that you're going to do liquids only for the 21 days. Others might choose to give up sweets. Maybe that's a real stronghold in your life. Maybe caffeine is something you're going to give up. Others might choose to fast the media, all forms of media. Maybe you're going to fast television for 21 days. Maybe you're going to fast social media. Listen, I put on my Instagram this week to have what you've never had. You've got to do what you've never done. Some of you might fast social media. Some of you might fast Pandora or Spotify or going to the movies. But you're going to fast the media for those 21 days. Some of you might observe a Daniel fast. You say, I don't even know what that is. If you read in the book of Daniel, Daniel and three others observed what we now know as a Daniel fast. There's all kind of information on the internet and there's information on our website about a Daniel fast. I'm going to give you the website in just a moment. Some of you might say no breads, no meats, no sweets for 21 days, but everybody can do something, something and participate at some level. Here's the second thing. This is from one of our elders, one of our intercessors. He said, there needs to be no judgment about what somebody else is or is not doing. You know, you might encounter somebody that says, hey, I'm giving up sweets for 21 days. And, and you may be in your mind, you're going, oh my gosh, is that all you're doing? That's so easy. Maybe for them it's not. Maybe you're doing liquids only and there's this thing of judgment that comes over you. Ah, I'm doing liquids only and you're only giving up television. Ah. No judgment in the 21 days that you do what God calls you to do. You be obedient. And I promise you if you ask him, he'll show you what to do. Here's the third thing. That in these 21 days beginning tomorrow, 
that you don't moan and groan and complain about the things that you're giving up, but you constantly set your affection and your eyes on Jesus. He's the prize. He's the prize that we're going after. Listen, I, I'm not seeing this for any reason except just to help bring some clarity and to challenge you. I started fasting for the first time when I was in the sixth grade. I still remember to this day, I could take you to the spot that I was sitting, students around that lunch table making fun of me because I was fasting. I didn't understand everything about fasting then. In fact, I understood very little about fasting then. I just knew if Jesus did it, I should do it. If Jesus walked this earth, and, and in order to complete what he completed, he needed to fast and pray, and he's my example, how much more do I need to fast and pray? And from that time, from the sixth grade until now, I've practiced a discipline of fasting in my life. And I know what it means at times to get so fixated on what I'm giving up for that period of time. And really miss out on the intimacy and the, and the time of the Lord. I'm just challenging you during these 21 days that you really just run to the Lord over and over and over. And that you hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Jesus said this, if you'll hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be satisfied. You will be satisfied. Now on our website, we've made available to you a daily devotional beginning tomorrow written by our pastors and some of our board members some of our staff, and if you go to the websites, www.therefuge backslash Sela 2019, it's right there on the screen. Take a picture if you need to, write it down. Go to that website because there's also some resources about fasting. There's some articles that we've put there. There's examples of different fasts that you can do, and all of that's available for you. And I want to challenge you in a few moments. We're going to observe communion together. And then we're going to walk out of this place, and as we do, I'm going to challenge you to take the time. And there'll be a line. That's okay. Just won't take long. There's plenty of chalk pens there by each of those Selah walls. Grab one of those chalk pens and just quickly sign your name. And by doing that, it's just between you and the Lord. You're signing your name, but you're saying, God, I'm going to participate at some level. I want to ask you. What are you willing to do in 2019 to recover your cutting edge? What are you willing to do in 2019 in order to walk in a greater anointing than what you did in 2018? What are you willing to do in 2019 to overcome the addiction that has plagued you for years? What are you willing to do in 2019 to see those strongholds torn down in your life? To have what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. I'm calling you as your pastor. Let's fast and pray. Let's sharpen our axes. Let's recover the cutting edge. It can happen to anybody. Let's recover the cutting edge in 2019. I believe if we do that, and if we don't lose it, I believe that if we'll recover the cutting edge and if we'll take time to pull back and to sharpen the ax throughout the year, I believe that no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what comes our way, seen or unforeseen, I believe that no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, that we will walk in the anointing, the, the breaking anointing of Jesus throughout this entire year. Does anybody believe that this morning? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. In fact, I want you to stand to your feet right now all across this place. Father, thank you so much for your word that